Good morning, and welcome to Christ United Methodist Church. If you have any prayer concerns you would like to have mentioned this morning, just a reminder, the blue cards are in your pews, and to hand those to an usher during our first hymn. In our bulletin, you'll find there are many announcements here on page two. I'll cover a few of these. So the first is a reminder that we have church in the park on June 19th at 11 a.m., and that's in Silver Park. Um, you're welcome to bring your own chair, and also there will be a potluck afterwards. So pr please bring a dish to share and your own plates and utensils. Also, Friday, June 17th is the kickoff of the Concert at the Caboose series, and our church will be the, the first um, church to sponsor a booth there, and Jimmy and the Soul Blazers will be there, and so we'll be serving popcorn, ice cream, soda, and water um, for a free will offering, and all of those proceeds um, benefit Alliance Habitat for Humanity. And lastly, the UMF unit meeting is held Tuesday, June 7th at a special time. There will be a supper and fellowship provided at 6.30 p.m. in the Dussel Room, and the meeting will begin at 7.15 with the option to Zoom in. Contact Nancy Preter if you'd like a Zoom invitation. And the program will be UMW, UMW book list reviews provided by Pat Stone. Are there any other announcements? Please stand and join with me in the call to worship. The day of Pentecost has come, and we are together. Will the works of God be known among us today? We are all together and around and within us to give emptiness. God comes to us as a gentle breath or violent wind. Catch your breath, God's breath, and live. The fires of love dispel life's shadows. God's Spirit comes to give us new life.
please join with me in the opening prayer. Let us pray together. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and we shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by that same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy your consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear friends, we come to this sacred time when we lift before God our prayers and petitions for the members and friends of our fellowship and their families. God knows the prayers in our minds and hearts before we speak, but we need to acknowledge them as we gather so that we can take them with us when we leave here and continue to lift them before God during the week ahead. I want to ask especially for prayers for the family and friends of Ethan Liming. Ethan is the 17-year-old son of the Reverend Bill and Cindy Liming, who was beaten to death last Thursday evening in Akron. His dad, Bill Liming, is the pastor of Montrose Zion United Methodist Church in Akron. Over 500 friends and fellow students gathered on Friday evening on the football field where Ethan played football. Ethan was a student leader at Firestone Community Learning Center where he was in the Academy of Design. Keep him and his brothers and sister and the entire family in your prayers. Now we have a list of prayer concerns in our bulletin. I'm not going to read it to you. I know you can read. And, um, and God knows those names and those concerns even before we put it to paper. That's the wonderful thing about our God. Let us pause before the throne of God's heavenly grace. Loving God, whose very breath gives us life. Allow your spirit to blow freely through this place. May we feel your mighty winds clearing away our disbelief, our reluctance, and our ambivalence, leaving only the full knowledge that we are yours. We rejoice to be part of your amazing creation, May the winds and flames of Pentecost remind us of all that you meant for us to be. When your people wandered in the desert, you longed for a time when all your people would be prophets. Put your spirit on us this day. We want to be your voice in the world. In the face of almost daily violence, let us speak words of peace no longer ignoring senseless shootings and murders and domestic violence and all the other forms of violence that make us want to turn away. And even as we ask for words, we also ask for the courage to listen to voices of those who are often silenced. Let us be companions to the lonely and the forgotten. Open to us the way of compassion and kindness to those most in need, the refugees and immigrants who come in need of sanctuary and new beginnings. 
those who are hungry and homeless and without hope, those who struggle with symptoms of illness in body, mind, or spirit, those who discomfort us or face the world with anger, patient and loving God, we know that all the broken and bruised places in this world and in our lives is not what you desire for your children. You remind us that we are one in Christ. Moreover, we are called to see Christ in our neighbors as well as in ourselves. Sometimes the labels we apply to each other are meaningless in your sight. Stir among us your spirit. And within us, we are no longer content in our pews. Guide us to new understanding of what it means to be the body of Christ here and now. Free us from all fears and anxieties that prevent us from living the good news loud enough for all who pass by to want to join in your joy. Let our hearts pour forth living water into this thirsty world. Holy God, whose strength and wonder we cannot begin to imagine, may we breathe deeply of your Spirit. And as we celebrate today the beginnings of your church, open us to all that is beginning to grow in us and around us. We would like to lay our burdens at your feet, but we cling to them because we can't imagine ourselves without them. Set our heads and our hearts on fire that we may be so bold as to trust you with our whole selves, making it possible for greater trust among our neighbors. We would be the people you called and created us to be. Breathe on us anew this day and be with each and every one of the people listed in our bulletin in need of prayer. Be with the Liming family as they suffer the death of their 17-year-old son and brother and And then in gratitude for the grace that you have given to us, we pray. May our meditation be pleasing to you, for we do indeed rejoice in you. Let your mighty winds rush through us as we pray in Christ's name the prayer that he taught his followers, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Dear friends, remember your baptism. Those are appropriate words for us today. Remember that God loves each of us unconditionally in response to God's gift of love. Let us respond generously with our tithes and our offerings. Let the ushers wait upon us now.
God of wind and fire, breathe your Holy Spirit over us again this day. Help us to better hear one another and untangle the differences we have allowed to divide us. May your Spirit give us the power to be the church you had hoped we would be, one body, one people, seeking to build your beloved community of justice, mercy, and hope. As we bring our tithes and offerings to you this day, set us on fire once again. Fill us with your power in Christ, we pray. Amen.
we want to remember our pastor, Pastor John and his wife Patty, as they travel, the joy of spending some time with their son Jonah uh, out in Texas. I actually knew Jonah before I knew Pastor John. I knew Pastor John's hus or husband, father, before I knew Pastor John. I worked with Jonah on a chrysalis flight team, and uh, a finer young man you will not find anywhere. And it's a special joy for a played out retired pastor to be asked to conduct worship on one of the great festivals of the church here, the festival of Pentecost. Hear these words from the second chapter of the book of Acts. When the day of Pentecost came, the disciples were together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole place where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans, then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Perga and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in their own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had simply too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not intoxicated, as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Here are also these words of Jesus recorded for us in the Gospel of John. When the Holy Spirit comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, even the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness to me. And you also are witnesses because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I'm going to him who sent me. Yet none of you have asked me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. 
And when he comes, he will convince the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Because they do not believe me concerning righteousness. Because I go to the Father, and you will see me no more concerning judgment. Because the ruler of this world is also judged. I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. For when the Spirit comes, the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you to the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but where, whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Dear friends, there's a short street in London, not far from St. Paul's Cathedral with its great dome designed by Sir Christopher Wren, where a special service was held two days ago to celebrate the platinum jubilee of Her Majesty Elizabeth II. The name of the street is Aldersgate Street, a name that's become part of the memory and language of the church and its history, identified with the depth of religious experience which set the direction and gave power to a young Oxford don an ordained priest of the Anglican Church, and what would later become a worldwide denominational class meeting movement. In the language of Shakespeare, it can be said that some streets achieve historic greatness, while others have greatness thrust upon them. Aldersgate is a street whose grace greatness was thrust upon it and as such it's one of a small number of places that has achieved a special status in human history as the scene of a great spiritual transformation that changed the world forever the road to damascus long since buried in time where the Apostle Paul experienced a vision that shaped his life is another such place. There is a garden in Milan where St. Augustine heard a voice saying, take and read. Yet another prominent location. The church of St. John Lateran in Rome where Martin Luther heard with overwhelming power and clarity the words, the just shall live by faith alone, is another such place. It was on the 24th day of May, 284 years ago in 1738 that Aldersgate Street, London, was thrust into Christian history in a significant and life-altering way. A priest and missionary of the Church of England, having just returned from a difficult and somewhat humbling voyage to the New World as a missionary to the Indians, found himself unwillingly attending a prayer meeting on Aldersgate Street while completely entangled in a personal state of spiritual anxiety. His life to this point in time had been one of great passion, but he'd still not found peace and assurance in his faith. He was still wrestling with what God thought about him and his lack of acceptance of the presence of the Holy Spirit within himself. The words of this young priest used to describe his unsettling experience have become classic in Christian literature. He writes in his journal of that day, in the evening, I went quite unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where the leader was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. About a quarter to nine, 
while I was describing the change, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt that I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. In an instant, young John Wesley became obsessed with Christ in a way that he had never known before. Suddenly, he believed that a personal faith, what faith was enough for salvation, that one can accept salvation as an accomplished fact, that conviction, that obsession with Christ became the central belief of the Methodist societies, a conviction that drove Wesley throughout his life and ministry until the moment of his death in 1791 at the age of 88. The experience on Aldersgate Street was not unlike the experience shared by the disciples on the day of Pentecost the story that I've read to you, often referred to as the birth of the church, more appropriately, it is the time when the mission and ministry of the disciples is officially launched. Fifty days after the celebration of the Passover, the disciples had taken the time to regroup, to replace Judas, to consider their options and to discuss their future. They remained in Jerusalem because Jesus told them to do so at the time of the ascension. They waited, awaited the baptism of the Holy Spirit which came to them on the day of Pentecost. An in-depth examination of the text before us this morning indicates the disciples were not speaking in a euphoric language that required specific interpretation lest it be misunderstood, the remarkable realization of Pentecost is that this motley crew of Galileans with little formal education suddenly begins to speak in a language so clear and so precise that the cosmopolitan crowd in Jerusalem is not only able to hear them, but is able to understand clearly what they are saying. Dear friends, don't get hung up on speaking in tongues, on the mysterious, mysterious nature of, of the disciples' speech. There, there was no magic here. Just the miraculous, spirit-filled, and Christ-centered ability to be clearly understood by everyone present. One implication from the text is that the work of the Holy Spirit is not about confusion, but rather about unifying, edifying, and making the path clear. As we reflect further on the work of the Holy Spirit, we come to understand that wherever one group of Christians makes self-serving claims about owning a piece of the rock of faith, they tread on very dangerous ground. In other words, whether we claim to be spirit-filled Christians, Bible-believing Christians, or Christians of the mind and heart, we need to understand the transparency of those claims. Labeling, our, labeling ourselves or others may represent our human effort to stake out a higher place than we have a genuine right to claim. Elevating our own status tends to belittle the faith of others and becomes an arrogant or false claim on our part. A sidebar warning of the text before us this morning is that the coming of the Holy Spirit into the Christian community can never be misinterpreted as a prideful or personal claim. A second equally important distinction gleaned from this morning's text is that there's a difference between a show of power and empowering. The scene on the day of Pentecost is not simply a raw display of power exhibited by the Holy Spirit. What happens on the day of Pentecost causes the disciples 
to be thoroughly empowered by the Holy Spirit. What happens is the fulfillment and culmination of the promise of Jesus to his closest companions that the Holy Spirit will live in them and empower them to carry forth the good news, the gospel entrusted to them by Christ himself. More than anything else, the experience of Pentecost awakens in the disciples an overwhelming obsession to preach, to teach, and heal in the name of Jesus Christ. Prior to being infused with the Holy Spirit, the disciples tend to be well-meaning, but rather confused, prone to lapse in their faith and a bit dull in their efforts to witness to the power and presence of God in their lives. What about us? What about us? As we live out our faith today, do we present ourselves as well-meaning but rather confused, prone to lapse in our faith and a bit dull in our efforts to witness to the power and presence of God in our lives? Sure, we want to follow Jesus Christ. We want to be witnesses to him in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. But more often than not, we tend to far fall short of this intended goal. Much like the early disciples fell short of the goal Jesus set for them. And yet, and yet on the day of Pentecost, an astonishing transformation, transformation takes place. The often misguided, always slow to act, decidedly dull disciples chosen by Jesus to change the world are infused with the Holy Spirit and in an instant they become obsessed with Christ in a way they never knew before. The scriptures begin to treat them with greater respect instead of blundering into the future. The disciples begin to make accurate and critical decisions. Make no mistake, they don't become suddenly perfect. The scriptures remain candid about that but they become significantly different. During the transformation that takes place in the lives of the disciples, we have the story of the Holy Spirit taking up residence in their hearts and in their minds and in their lives. To be certain, the change didn't occur instantly in each disciple. Some of them still had deep and abiding questions that would take some time to answer. An awakening did occur that began a transition in the lives of those who followed Jesus, those who initially failed Jesus, and yet were still called by him to be witnesses to the power of the resurrection and were ultimately entrusted with the gospel and empowered by the Holy Spirit. The experience of Pentecost awakens the disciples enabling them to become the children of God, possessing everything necessary to proclaim Jesus as Lord. Not unlike the 35-year-old priest of the Anglican Church who, while attending a prayer meeting in Aldersgate Street, London, awakens to the fact that he is a child of God with the faith and assurance to do whatever is necessary to proclaim Jesus as Lord of all life. The story of the early disciples and the story of the young priest dramatically demonstrate what the Holy Spirit can do and the changes the Holy Spirit wants urgently to initiate in the lives of ordinary people like you and like me. What about us as we gather in this sacred place on the day of Pentecost? Can we experience the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our lives? Can we feel an awakening to new life within, enabling us to set aside our personal agendas and trivial concerns? Oh, I'm talking about the annual conference that's coming next week. I'm sorry. Set aside our own personal agendas and trivial concerns to see the larger picture of what God calls us to be and to become as followers of Christ. 
I believe with all my heart that the Spirit of God still comes to us, lives in us, changes us, and empowers us to become different from all that we have been before. As the children of God, we can begin to see ourselves as witnesses entrusted with the gospel of Jesus Christ and empowered to witness to the truth of that gospel to others. On the day of Pentecost, the first century disciples become obsessed with Jesus and set about changing the world in ways that continue to be felt even today. As followers of Jesus Christ, we may love... I think I just lost a page. As followers in Jesus Christ in the 20th century, we have a legacy to nurture, a, a birthright to uphold. As children of God who trace their roots back to a reformation that began in the early 16th century and spread like a consuming fire throughout Europe and across the ocean to America, we too have felt our hearts strangely warmed and by the knowledge of what God has done and continues to do through the Holy Spirit unleashed in our lives. And yet, and yet our true heritage stretches back centuries, long before the Reformation, back to the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, 50 days after Jesus' miraculous resurrection from the dead, when his disciples and closest friends are dramatically changed, given a voice and something to say, and become obsessed with Christ in a way that changed the fabric of their lives and the life of this world forever. In a similar way, our lives can be changed as we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit upon us this morning. And so may our prayer for today be and for all of life's tomorrows, the words of the familiar hymn, breathe on us breath of God, fill us with life anew. That we may love what thou dost love and do what thou wouldst do. Breathe on us breath of God, so shall we never die but live with thee the perfect life of thine eternity. Amen. Dear friends, <clears throat> into an upper room the risen Christ came through locked doors to be present with the gathered disciples, to breathe on them the Holy Spirit. Into an upper room Jesus came on another night to be with his disciples so that they would always remember his broken body in the breaking of bread and to make a new covenant with them, promising they would always taste the renewal of forgiveness when sharing the cup. Into this place, Christ has come to be with you and me, that we may know his presence in the breaking of bread and taste anew the forgiveness of sin and receive the Holy Spirit which unites us with all Christians. Shall we be at prayer? Hallowed Spirit, you hovered over the face of the waters and there was light and life. 
hover over this table, over this bread and cup, and let your divine light shine on us as we gather to share these gifts, that we might experience what it means to become a new creation. As Jesus breathed on his disciples, breathe your Holy Spirit on us. As he commissioned them with a ministry of forgiveness, help us to share your work of reconciling all people unto you. Like the mighty wind that gave life, passion, and unity to your church, let the breeze of your spirit revive, excite, and unite us in the love of Christ who offered his life for us. We gather this morning in remembrance of that night in an upper room in Jerusalem when Jesus celebrated the Passover feast with his disciples. During that meal, Jesus took bread, lifted it before God and asked God's blessing upon it. Then he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this, and when you do, remember me. Toward the end of that same supper, Jesus took a cup, lifted it before God, and asked God's blessing upon it, and then gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this, and when you do, remember me. This is our opportunity, dear friends, to reach all the way back from this place to that upper room and to touch the hand of Jesus and to be touched by that hand. So now I would ask the ushers to come forward as we prepare to receive the body and blood of our living Savior. Receive this bread as a promise that Jesus loves you and gave his life for you. Take and eat.
receive this cup letting Christ cleanse you and fill you with his love Shall we pray? Lord God, your lavish faithfulness puts us to shame. You have never given up on us, even though our history is one of unfaithfulness and discouragement. You have raised the dead to life in your Son and are raising us to new life each time we set aside ourselves for someone else having broken bread and shared the body and blood, the new life in Jesus Christ, we praise you and bless your name for your faithfulness and mercy. Amen. Let us stand and sing together. out into the world and labor to bring forth new life. Dream dreams, pursue visions, and speak of God's goodness in the words of those you would hear. And may the God who breathed life into all of creation be your delight. May Jesus Christ give hope to your dreaming, and may the Holy Spirit, your advocate and defender, set your hearts ablaze with a passion for peace. Go now in peace to love and serve God. In the name of Jesus Christ, his Son and our Savior. Amen. <laughs>